Can I come down here? Is that all right? All right. All right, I'll roam. No, just kidding. Well, uh, my name is Ryan Weekly, and as I shared, I'm from the, the east side, but it's great to be with you all this afternoon. And uh, we ready to hear the word of God? Yeah. All right, amen. I appreciate the worship team. I love that song. Um, if you don't know me, uh, again, my name is Ryan, and uh, my wife and I have been on staff here for about four years. And it was probably shared a couple weeks ago that um, after about 15 years in the ministry, in the full-time ministry, I'm going to be stepping away from the full-time ministry. Um, so actually, today will be uh, my last sermon as a staff member of the church, officially. Um, and if you have questions about that, you can feel free to talk to me at any point. Um, but honestly, you know, this has been, for, for myself, for my family, it's been a season of uh, a lot of prayer and discernment and fasting and input and uncertainty and kind of jumping into the unknown in the best of ways. And we really feel like God is, is really leading us in his will. And, uh, and, you know, I'm confident he will continue to work in every way. Um, but I do want to say thank you so much. Even since that announcement was made, even those of you out here have reached out with, with encouragement and support. Uh, thank you for your prayers. They are felt. And uh, you can continue to pray for us in this time of transition. Um, but it, it's funny, you know, when the guys asked me to preach today, I, it took a long time for me to uh, figure out what passage I wanted to dwell in today. Because when the Bible talks about farewells, uh, the context of those passages didn't really seem to fit where I'm at. And here's what I mean. When the Old Testament records a person's kind of farewell, it's because the person is dying. Right? It, they, they say stuff like, I'm about to be gathered to my people, or I'm about to go the way of all the earth. I'm not dying, okay? That's not, context doesn't fit there, so that one didn't work. One of the goodbyes I looked at in the, uh, the New Testament uh, was Paul's farewell to the uh, Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. I think it's chapter 20. And, uh, you know, he says this to them. He says, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that none of you will ever see me again. Again, I'm not going to Jerusalem. Y'all will see me again. Um, hopefully, the announcement made it clear. But uh, my wife, Virginia, will be staying on staff full time. And she'll be uh, continuing her role there. Uh, but we're staying in Phoenix. We're staying in Midpoint. We're not moving anywhere. We're not going to another church. We are here to stay. This is our family. And so you'll still see us. I've talked to Forrest about still being in kind of the preaching rotation every now and then. So we'll see how that works out. But um, so this is not like a swan song or a farewell or a goodbye or anything like that. Um, and I know my service to God and to the church will look very differently, and that's okay. Um, but I'll, I'm going to be faithful, amen? And God is sovereign through all of it, even in seasons of beginnings and endings, amen? Um, so today, we're going to jump back into the book of John. Next slide, please. Maybe next one. There we go. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 7. If you've been with us for the last few months, again, we, we took a uh, few weeks of a break from the uh, study of the book of John. But we've been going through this gospel. I hope you have been able to study these words on your own. On a Sunday morning or afternoon, we go through a lot of text. We talk about a lot of things. And so I hope that you can take these words, especially the scriptures, and go through them in your own time with God during the week. Uh, but as we begin to kind of get back into our study here, I want to remind us of, of what we have seen in the life and ministry of Jesus thus far. All right? You know, we first looked at John's words about Jesus' introduction to the study of Jesus, he's the light of the world. He is God in the flesh, he is fully God, he's fully man, he is fully God, he is 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 fully man, he is fully God,
Check, check, check. Awesome. That way Zoom can hear. Um, so Jesus is inviting all to come and see, right? We've seen Jesus do amazing things. He's turning water into wine. We saw him heal an official son from long distance, right? He fed what could have been 12,000 people on that day with two fish and five loaves. He's flipping tables in the temple courts, walking on water. And along the way, Jesus has started to make some pretty bold claims about himself. He's claimed to be the source of living water, the bread of life, and even the Messiah. All right, so we're going to pick things up in chapter uh, 7 of John. These sermon notes are in the app. If you have the app, if you don't have the app, get it, because all these sermon notes are on there. But the title of our lesson here is Missing the Messiah. You know, just to give us some context of what is going on here in uh, John chapter 7, this is the, the time for the annual Jewish festival called the Feast of Tabernacles. And this was a very joyful, week-long celebration for the Israelites. And during this festival, families would uh, go into the wilderness and camp out in temporary um, structures to remind themselves of how God had provided for his people in the wilderness in the time of the uh, Exodus. And so it's like a godly Burning Man festival, all right, to remember the faithfulness of God. All right, that started with God's people. (laughs) Um, John 7, let's pick it up in verse 10. I don't know if that's true. I just threw it out there. Uh, Verse 10. We're going to read for a while. We're going to jump around a little bit. Just follow me. After his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Jump down to verse 25. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Still many in the crowd believed in him. They said, When the Messiah comes, will he perform perform more signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Verse 33, Jesus said, I am with you only for a short time, and then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you won't find me? And where I am, you cannot come. Finally here, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. All right, we'll stop there for today. Again, there is a lot there. 
Please go through this on your own in your own Bible study. But there are just a couple things I would love to draw our attention to this afternoon. First is the concept of who Jesus is. You know, when Jesus arrives at the temple, if you were to read the beginning of chapter 7, he actually says, no, you know what, I'm not going to go up there. Why don't you go on without me? And then once they go, he kind of goes like incognito, like, you know, lets them go, and he's going in secret, and he hears people talking about him. Some are describing him as a good man, others as a man who deceives people. Very big difference between those two, right? In verse 20, we didn't read that, but they, some accuse him of being demon-possessed. In verse 40, some believe he's a prophet. Verse 41, others believe him to be the Messiah. And it's interesting to me that all of these people are hearing the exact same words, yet coming to very different conclusions as to who he is. Is he the Messiah? Is he the, the one we've been waiting for? Or is he crazy? Isn't this Joseph's son? Like, why is he up there? Where did he get all this, this knowledge, this, this wisdom? Who is this guy? Is he some wannabe, some radical? Is he a prophet? Is he crazy? I don't know. And even further, what do we do with him? Should we stone him or crown him king? Should we persecute him or listen to him? Should we arrest him or embrace him? And something I think that I, I see in this text, and I think this is for all of us today, everything hinges on who you believe Jesus to be. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Your identity, your purpose, your relationships, your future, your perspective, your capacity for compassion, your uh, hope, your joy, your peace, everything hinges on who you believe Jesus to be. So the first question we need to tackle is who is Jesus, right? Now, there are at least a couple ways to go about answering this question. The first one I think of, because just the way I'm wired, is the facts and figures approach, right? A lot of people, when you make a claim, they want proof, right? And so even in, in Christianity, talking about Jesus, sometimes we can try to offer proof, right? We give dates and times and evidences. This is where the, the field of apologetics comes from. And it's Philip's approach with Nathaniel in John chapter 1. He goes to Nathaniel and says, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Philip is using the scriptures to prove and kind of describe who Jesus is. The second approach is more based not on facts and figures, but on personal experience. This is the approach of the Samaritan woman. After in John 4, when the Samaritan woman spends time with Jesus at the well, she doesn't go back to her town and says, hey, I found the one that, that came from the scriptures that Moses wrote about. She says, come and see a man who showed me or told me everything I ever did. You know, some are more moved by facts and figures. Others more moved by story and experience. And both are in the Gospels and in Acts and in the letters to follow, both are effective ways to answer the question of who Jesus is. And, you know, I'm more analytical by nature. I I'm normally start with the prove it kind of stuff, so I thought I'll challenge myself and start on the other side of things. But who is Jesus? I want you to think about it. If as you were walking into church, there was someone at the door and they asked you that question, how would you answer that? Who is Jesus? Who is he to you? Who has he been in your life? How has he changed your life? Especially for those who call him and recognize him as Lord. What kind of freedom and peace and community have you found in him? You know, I know for my life, before becoming a Christian, I, I wasn't even thinking about the why behind anything I was doing. Like, there was no thought of purpose in my life. I was just going, and I was chasing happiness in girls and relationships and intimacy. I was chasing happiness in being excellent at whatever I was doing. You ask my, my parents, I was super uh, hard on myself, especially when it came to music. I wanted to be the best, and I thought that I could be content and confident if I was the best, and I would give all this effort, and that's kind of what life was about. But I love Peter's words. I think it's 1 Peter 
3, you can challenge me on that, where he says, I have been redeemed from an empty way of life. That is what Jesus has done for me. I think of my family. My mom became a Christian as a single mom uh, in San Diego when I was about four. And uh, she had my sister and I, and then a few years later, she married my stepdad, who's also a Christian. He had a couple boys, and so we were this blended family. And I, I think, really, the man I am, the man of God I am, I owe a lot to their faith, yeah. my parents' faith, and their perseverance with me when I was crazy and running around and, and totally living a lie and doing all I was doing. I think of my family now with Virginia and our kids. Like, I know the only way I can be the man and the husband and the father I want to be is with Jesus. Amen. Even all, all week long, uh, where is it? Let me find it. Um, I've, I've started a new job, and literally every day this week, I've been dwelling on John seven eighteen. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. That's who I want to be. I want to be about the man who sent me. I can't do that without God. I can't do that without Jesus, right? He has changed my life. And if we walk with Jesus, we all, all of us could line up. We have stories to tell, right? We have experiences to share so this world can see and get to know Jesus. And that's what it means to be a witness. We witness not just to what is true and reasonable, which, which it certainly is, but also we witness to what we have seen and heard. I love that, that story, that personal experience. Now, if you go to the facts and figures, if you were to look to the scriptures to answer this question, who is Jesus, you would have more answers than you know what to do with, right? You could look at what Jesus said about himself, you could look about at what others said about him. You could look in the Old Testament and look to what the patriarchs and the kings and the prophets all say about Jesus. It's incredible. So many words to describe who our king is. I love it. And on this point, I want to share an excerpt of a, a sermon I heard probably about 12, 13 years ago. But ever since I heard it, it has stuck with me. Uh, it was written and spoken in the 70s by a Baptist preacher by the name of Dr. Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. I'm not making that name up. It's S.M. Lockridge for short. Um, and this is also in the app if you want to either follow along or kind of check it out later. But just listen to this, and I'll try to, I'll try to do it justice. He says, my king was born king. The Bible says my king is king in seven ways. He's the king of the Jews. That's a racial king. He's the king of Israel. That's a national king. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's my king. David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. My king is the only one whom no means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supplies. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. That's my king. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in himself. He's dignified and he's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the core and necessity of spiritual religion. That's my king. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's the only one able to supply all of your needs simultaneously. He supplies strength to the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He's our guard and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. 
He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. That's my king. Are you with me? I'm not even halfway done. All right, here we go. My king is the key of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway to peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes, the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's my king. His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him completely, but he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible, he's invincible, he's irresistible. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him, let alone a man explain him. You can't get him out of your mind, you can't get him off your hand, you can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to, de- to agree. Herod couldn't kill him, death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. He always has been, and he always will be. He has no predecessor, and he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him, and there'll be nobody after him. You can't impeach him, and he won't resign. That's my king. It says in Matthew 6, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. And you try to count how long that is. Good luck. Forever and ever and ever and ever. And when after all those forevers, amen. That's our king. That is who Jesus is. Right, and again, as I said, everything hinges on who you believe Jesus to be. If Jesus is just a part of history to you, if he's a historical figure to you, then guess what? His grace and his truth and his power, all of that will just remain on the pages of a history book. If he is just a teacher or a wise man to you, you might learn one or two great things from him, but your life will still be your own. But if he is your king, then he will have your heart and your mind and your allegiance. He will have your love, your submission, and your devotion. So I wanna ask you today, who is Jesus to you? I love what Troy was speaking to in the communion. If you had to answer this with your life rather than your words, what might be the answer? You know, sadly, I think a lot claim that Jesus is Lord, but their lives don't look much different than the people around them, than the world around them. Your life will answer this question a lot louder than your mouth will. Amen? Amen. Who is Jesus to you? Second here, uh, goes back to the, uh, the passage here. You know, I, I can't help but think, as I was studying out John 7, Jesus is teaching at this festival, and all of these people hearing him I think got to experience something that all of us wish we could, right? They were literally in the presence of the Son of God, hearing the red letters spoken in real time. And yet, they seem to be completely missing the point. You know, rather than be affected and impacted by his teaching, they get stuck on, how did this guy learn so much? Rather than be convinced by his miracles, they ask if more signs and wonders are coming. As Jesus is trying to explain that he was sent by the Father, they get lost in questions about where he's from. As Jesus is speaking of living water that can flow from within them, they get stuck in this like paralysis of analysis, just focused on birthplaces and families of origin. And they're they're missing the glorious words that are actually coming from his mouth. And I don't know about you, but I can, I can look at stories like this in scripture and think, what in the world are you doing? Like, pay attention, people. Like, you have the son of God in your presence. Listen to him. You're missing the point. You're missing him. But how often can we 
even as followers of Jesus, miss our Messiah. You know, we can read the Bible, the inspired words of God, on autopilot. As a verse of the day. Even with apathy at times. We can praise if no one is listening. We can gather and worship without actually gathering and worshiping. You know what I'm saying? And I think whether it's as individuals or even in the church, at times, we can be so focused on the wrong things. We can be so focused on our questions, our circumstances, our hurts, our preferences, our opinions of how things should be done, our experiences, our knowledge, our needs, our doubts, our fears, our plans, our priorities, the list could go on, right? And I'm not saying that you should just blindly check all those at the door, but I am saying that we are not meant to be the center of our attention. And over time, we can become so fixed on all of this extra stuff that the Christian life, the life that began with a Savior and a cross and a resurrection becomes more about us than it does about Jesus. You know, relationship with God can become more about duty or appeasing an almighty judge or what we can get from God rather than walking humbly with God. Relationships with one another, they can become more about what, what I receive, what I get out of it, who I click with. And we can have these standards sometimes that are just shallow. And the, these relationships that we don't allow any kind of input, we don't allow any kind of encouragement or admonishment rather than carrying each other's burdens and helping one another become fully mature in Christ. The church can become a club rather than the body of Christ. It can become a community that is meant to serve the needs of those in this room rather than the body of Christ that is meant to be built up for us to be a blessing to all of those outside of these walls. Amen? Without Jesus, we are nothing. You know, as individuals, without Jesus, we cease to be who God has called us to be. You cannot be a man or woman of God if you are not remaining in him. As a church, we cease to be the church without Jesus. You know, Paul says in Colossians 1, who is the head of the church? Who's the head of the church? Jesus. If Jesus is not prompting and permeating everything we're doing here, we are not a church. Without Jesus, we are nothing. I think these passages uh, are really meaningful to me on this topic. You know, Paul's admonition to the church here in Colossians uh, 3. In verse 1, he says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You know, the author of Hebrews writes this, many of us know this, writing to a people that are struggling to hold on to God in the midst of all these cultural uh, and, and familial pressures and persecutions and all these things. He says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Not the race the world is telling us to run, the race that has been marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I'll stop there. The directions are clear. Set your heart. Set your mind on things above. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I want to ask this morning, are you missing the Messiah? Is there any way in which you have taken your eyes off of Jesus? And if so, these words of Colossians 3 and Hebrews um, 12, they're perfect for us, right? And the, I, I love those passages because those are postures, those are mindsets that we can choose to have at any point in any day to set our heart and our mind, to fix my eyes. That is well within our grasp. That is well within our, our choice to do so, amen? And we're fixing our eyes not on ourselves or these superfluous things of Christianity, but on our King our Lord of Lords, on Jesus, amen? Um, you know, I was praying a lot about this, 
You know, all week I've been praying a lot. If I... <laughs> I think it's all just kind of hit me. Um, if I had one hope for this church as I step away from staff, it would be this. Do not forget why we're here. We are not here because of a worship team, because of a preacher, because of a building because this is the closest place you can go to your house, right? You probably have a lot of options. We're not here because you've just been here for a while. We're not here to placate our guilt or to act apart, right? We are here because of Jesus. We are here because he has changed our life, given us new life, redeemed us from the empty way of life, right? We're here as a community because we are gathered by his blood and resurrection to be a blessing to this world. Do not forget why we're here. Remember who he is. Be confident in that. Don't miss him. Don't take your eyes off him. Amen. Truly from the bottom of my heart, thank you um, for all your support. My family have, have loved this church. I've loved being here. And uh, yeah, amen. To God be the glory. I love you guys.